welcome friends to this afternoon session of our monthly meeting hope you enjoyed the pizza <laughs> those who enjoyed it please raise your hand those who didn't raise your hand <laughs> you are getting attached to pizza now <laughs> we were talking of detachment and here even simple things in life make us a test the <coughs> attachment can be taken care of by getting attached to something else we often mention that detachment cannot be practiced the more you try to detach the more you begin to get attached but if you get attached to something alternative something different then you can actually get detached so when you are love for your master goes inside or even before it goes inside when it's outside that love can so overpower you and if you're thinking of master all the time then detachment starts automatically so love and devotion for master remembering the master remembering actually how you saw him not remembering in abstract Oh, I remember my master. Take a picture of him. No, not even a photo. Is remembering the master as you saw him. What do you remember of that? Those memories, if you hold and keep on thinking of it again and again, brings you gradual detachment from things which are not important. The other thing is that what causes attachment to continue is desire. Our desires for things in life. Are creating attachment, so you cannot talk of attachment alone. So desire and attachment both put together that create the problems of attachment. If there's no desire, you become desireless. You you accept what comes, then you don't have those attachments also. So desire and attachment go together, and the answer is to get attached to something inside. Supposing you like pizza. I like pizza. Ye old shaky's pizza. I happen to mention this ye old shaky's pizza, but I said just a story I'm telling because I got detached. Truthfully, if I had got detached, I wouldn't tell the story. I would have forgotten about it. Now that I said, let me forget it now. People are telling me where I can find shaky's pizza. <laughs> One they found in Manila, Philippines. One they found in Japan. Once they found it in this country again, I am attached again. Very, this problem of attachment and detachment is not an easy one at all. As these attachments, we have to handle it in a particular way. That put attention so much on something else that they become less important. Even if they are not fully detached, but you are less attached to them to something more. They can be changed the degree of attachment. even that is very helpful so i uh, just because we it was a nice speech uh, today i thought i might mention this but i like to answer some of your questions that you have sent to jonathan sometimes you inform us how useful meditation is but sometimes you mention it is only for the mind and is not necessary <clears throat> if one has faith in the man and is not necessary if one has faith in the master My mind uses that as an excuse to not meditate. Please guide on what to do. Sometimes you will form us how useful meditation is, but sometimes you mention it only for the mind, not necessary. I don't say not necessary. <laughs> I say it's only for the mind. That does not make it unnecessary. Especially after you heard me this morning talking about. How much power we are given to the mind? Meditation becomes very important. If you are making your mind so important in your life, meditation is equally important for the mind. Meditation will take care of the mind. That is why, even what I suggested as a method of ignoring the mind, is through meditation. A particular kind of meditation. Meditation of several kinds. We do meditation to station ourselves in here. We do meditation. To repeat words, we do meditation 
to hear the sound, we hear, do meditation to remember our master and we also do meditation to make our connection with the mind weak. Meditation is what affects the mind. So therefore, I have said meditation is for the mind, not for the soul. It's very important if the mind is leading your lives for you. That's why it becomes important. If one has faith in the master, my mind sees that as an excuse to not meditate. Please guide. It is definitely an excuse. <laughs> meditate. Meditate more. Meditate even more. Till you can say, I have controlled my mind. I said, stop meditating. <laughs> it's not easy. Meditation is very important because we have no other real means available except to go in and meditate, taking care of the mind, making changes in our life, making changes in our attitude, so that the mind becomes under our control. We tell the mind what to do. We are not trying to dismiss the mind. We are not saying mind is not important. We are saying use the mind and do not let the mind rule over you. This is happening now. So that is why meditation is very important for that. What is the best way to respond to people who say offensive comments about trans or gay people? I get very agitated and defensive. I would like to stay in my third eye, but it hurts my heart. <coughs> what is the best way to respond to people who say offensive comments about trans or gay people, I get very agitated and defensive. I like to stay in my third eye, but it hurts my heart. How about responding with love to those people? How about saying in your own mind, they don't know what they are saying. They don't even know what they are saying. They need compassion to understand. Not that you get hurt. They are hurting themselves by the comments they are making, offensive comments. And what should be your reaction? If somebody is hurting himself, would you like to criticize them more? To hurt them more? Because you feel hurt? No. Use compassion. If you meditate regularly, compassion will come to you naturally. Another usefulness of meditation. Deal with all situations. Somebody is criticizing you, talking bad about you, ill about you. Say thank you. You've taken away my burden from my mind. Thank you with compassion. There's, there is a saying Kabir said that if somebody criticizes me, I welcome it because he's taking away, washing away my karma. And I don't react. If I react, I'll be adding to my karma. I don't react. I say thank you, therefore I finish my karma. So that is why the response should always be with love and calmness. And when a person uses offensive language and you become hurt and, and hurtful and respond to it, he succeeds. If you don't get hurt, you say thank you with love, he fails. The whole attempt of one who is offensive is to hurt you. But if you are not hurt, he fails. So therefore, don't think that responding in equal terms is the best way to do it. You, in the beginning, you might feel hurt. Then train your mind before saying anything, before thinking anything, count up to 200. <laughs> you will forget it. What is the consequence, what is the karmic consequence to an initiate of a perfect living master if he or she eats meat, unfertilized eggs after initiation? How does one escape these consequences? What is the karmic consequence to an initiate of a perfect living master if he or she eats meat, unfertilized eggs after initiation? How does one escape these consequences? The consequence is not in the eating of the meat. The consequence is not following what the master said. I think eating meat is not such a bad thing 
as disobeying the master. So when I am today vegetarian, various reasons, most important reason, number one, my master told me. Supposing he tells me to eat meat, I will eat meat. It will be better, it's not in the meat. Look at this thing. We are talking of a spiritual truth which tells us this is a projected temporary world. Can meat become such an important thing? Can diet become such an important thing? That the diet is controlling your spirituality? It's not so. It is that in this state, a certain diet is useful for meditation. And when a master says, follow their diet, what he says follow is far more important than the diet. So therefore the consequence is not of the meat or the eggs or whatever. Consequence is that you have not followed the master's wishes. One of the big things that happens to a person who is in love, he does not want to displease the beloved. And if we are in love with the master, we don't want to displease the master. It's a huge thing not to displease the master. Remember again and again the story of Ulle Shah, that great mystic, how he had a wedding in his family and he invited his own master, Anayat Ali Shah, to the wedding. Anayat Ali Shah was busy, he could not attend the wedding. So he asked one of his servants, will you please go and represent me in the wedding? So the servant of Anayat Allah went to the wedding said, he could not, master could not come, I have come in his place. But the family of Bulle Shah said, he's just a servant. And servants were put separately, not attending the main wedding party. So he was seated with the other servants of the family. And so when he came back, Inayat Tula asked him, did they treat you with respect because you were representing me? He said, no, they put me with the servants. He said, they should have realized that when I send you as my representative, you are representing me. So what they do to you, they are doing to me. It was not nice. And this message went around to Bulle Shah that his family had displeased the one. And he cried and he cried and he said, the worst thing could have happened. I displeased my master. And he wrote the most poignant poetry of his life during that period, when he was suffering, suffering, that how will I atone for what I have done? He did not really do, his family did it, but he could have stopped it. He felt, he felt he was responsible for displeasing his master. And his poetry at that time is worth reading. How one feels when one feels one has displeased the master. What is the consequence? The consequence is your own suffering. Therefore, he tried to meet the master. Master would not give him interview. Master would not meet him. He felt even worse. Then one day, there was a wedding in the master's house. A wedding. And they had invited some dancing girls, which was customary in those days. So the dancing girls were performing to entertain the guests. And Pullesha found a way to sneak into the party, put on women's clothes, and began to dance with the dancing girls. And Ayatullah saw, and he saw that he is not in step with the other dancers. So he called him. He said, are you Bulla Shah? He said, no, I'm Bulla Shah. Bulla means I made a mistake. So forgive me. So Master forgave him, I gave him a hug, he was happy. Just a story to tell that the consequence of meat eating or not eating is very minor. But the consequence on your own self of displeasing the master is very high. What is the cause of mental illness and why is it more prevalent in recent times, i.e. schizophrenia, hearing voices? What is the cause of mental illness and why it is more prevalent in recent times like schizophrenia? Just like we have physical problems, we have mental problems. 
The mental problems make us act in a different way. Our behavior changes, and we can observe that we are not uh, not following the norms of behavior. So we put aside. Mental illness is illness of the mind, and they are diagnosing it as illness of the brain in our head. But the illness of the body and the mind are both illnesses, and they both arise from our own karma from the past. There is no difference. Old times, people used their bodies a lot more than their mind. They did not have to use iPhones. They did not have to use computers. They did not have to calculate too many things. They certainly did not have to compute too many things. There was no thought of quantum physics. The simple life, body was the most important thing. So the body illnesses. As time has grown, our body activity has become less and less. Mental activity has increased. So illness has to fall. Whatever is more available to it. So mind is more available for illness today than the body. Therefore, mental illness has increased. The treatment for the body, medical treatments of different kinds. The urani treatment in Greece, and there is a Ayurvedic treatment in India. The homeopathic treatment. Naturopathy, modern allopathic medicine, all kinds of treatments are available, and those treatments are treating the body, and now they want to treat the mind. It is a new thing. If hundred years ago you said we treat the mind, they wouldn't understand. In fact, Sigmund Freud, Simon Freud, was the first one who brought up the big issue that the the effect of our actions on the mind creates mental illness. And that is affecting the body also. Now today we recognize the importance of the mental health over the bodily health. It's become known now today. So therefore, more treatments are available. First, we thought that the mind was a mind was a substance we don't know about. To handle the mind, we had to use our mind. That was called the old psychological method, the psychiatric method. What used to be called the talking out cure. People would go with mental problems, and the psychiatrist would make them talk over past life, past experiences, and bring them up, and bring all the old hidden emotions, and make them feel well. And the principle was simple: that when you were a child and had experienced trauma, that trauma was huge for you. When you grow up, that trauma is a very minor thing. So they bring that memory back. And it is hidden as a complex in your subconscious. They bring it to the conscious, and looks pretty well. And therefore, the old trauma goes. This was a basic theory of psychiatry. So, but now we moved forward. We are now looking at the brain and the cells, how they work, and the chemistry of the brain. Modern psychiatrists don't do that method of making you talk over. They say it's chemistry. He did a prescription. Take this chemical, take this prescription, eat this drink, and take the medicine. You'll be all right. That is why we are using so much of it. One of the biggest problem that has been located now, especially in the West, especially in the United States, is the problem of loneliness. I read a paper only the other day that loneliness has created more sickness than any other cause. That is why where is loneliness coming from? People are married in families feel lonely. People sitting in a crowd feel lonely. Nobody understands them. They say nobody understands us. We are lonely because we are separated. Where does this come from? It looks like we are not used to the same kind of understanding of togetherness as we understand today. Families. The word family meant a lot. Family is meant living together. The family. They lived together. They were interdependent. There was a certain amount of security in a family. Family is broke. Individual independence was more important. Getting loneliness by the very movement of this big social movement. That independence. We should be independent. Dependence. Was necessary. Even now we are depending, but we feel lonely. Who to depend on? Previously we knew who to depend on. 
the family, the society, the state, everything was to depend on something and not be insecure. Now we are more insecure than ever before, more lonely than ever before. Is it a bad thing? Not from the spiritual point of view. My master, the great master, predicted that the access of spirituality, which has existed in a long way in the East, in China, in India, in the Middle East, is shifting to the West. And he said, one of the reasons where people become seekers is loneliness. Therefore, on the one hand, loneliness is a mental problem and leads to depression, leads to taking Prozac, antidepressants. On the other hand, the very loneliness is making more people seekers of some other truth. So that is why it's double-edged sword. So when we talk of mental illness, we're talking of something that is connected with depression, which comes from loneliness. And yet the very loneliness that's creating the problems can also make us into a seeker of the spiritual truth. So it's best to know the disadvantages and advantages of both. Now I do suggest to people, if they have got a mental problem, if they're depressed, they should get, if possible, follow a master. Any master. If you are seekers, you will get a perfect giving master automatically. If you are just depressed, follow a master. The dependency on the advice of somebody will take your depression away. It's a better remedy than all the antidepressants you are taking. So there are ways of handling it. And if the master will say, meditate, remember me, loneliness disappears, depression disappears. I have seen these miracles happen with my own friends. I have seen over there in the United States and outside. So, whereas we are concerned with the increase of mental illness over the years, it's also part of the great shift of the spiritual seeking from the East to the West. Great Master said that these things will happen here. People will get fed up of their current way of living. They will be fed up of evil affluence. And they will seek because affluence will not give them happiness. And what will the East do? India, China, they will look for affluence. More industry, more factories, more jobs. I, I am seeing myself, his predictions coming out true right now. In fact, when he mentioned this, I was 11 years old, in 1937. He mentioned this to his American disciple, Julian Johnson. This will happen one day, that you will see the spirituality moving there. I heard it. It stuck in my head. I said, one day, I must go to America and take a ringside seat to see the show shifting to America. And that's why I'm here. And I'm seeing the show of the shift of spirituality to this country in a particular way. In the West, generally, but the United States, now, <clears throat> how does a PLM protect his initiate from the initiate's enemies or people with ill will and ill intention toward the initiate? How does a PLM protect his initiate from the initiate's enemies or people with ill will, evil intention toward the initiate? If we ask this question, we have not understood the law of karma. There are no enemies. We created them with our karma. They have come to take revenge because we did something to them. It's a payback situation. We don't remember what we did. Therefore, we take it as a local event and they become enemies. What we did to them, we don't remember. We don't even know about our past lives. We don't even know if they existed or not. You have to meditate to discover that you had past life, not only that, that what you did can be it's visible to you. You can remember it. Memories can come back. So when you remember it, you very quickly forgive all these enemies. Thank you. Thank you for taking care of this. I did this to you. I deserve it. Thank you. The whole attitude changes. So that is why when we say these are our enemies, masters help them in the sense that they try to prevent harm from coming in so many ways in this current body. But they allow an event to take place so that the karma is paid off. 
So what they say is, it makes a bearable experience. Masters make it a bearable experience, but experience still takes place. So the karma, law of karma operates like that. It is a very strong law. There are not, not too many exceptions in that law. So that is why they are doing good, bad, whatever we are made, made up, which we did in the past, same thing is working now. And these enemies, we were their enemies in the past. We did something, they are doing it now. Pray to master if it is hurtful, if it is harmful. Masters have protected their, their disciples from getting harm, even in dealing with enemies. So many times. And masters do it in such a way that we don't even realize that they are doing it. Sometimes we can see master actually appearing. I remember there was a pastor in India, name is Baba Fakir Chang. And Fakir Chang always said that masters know nothing about what's happening to the people. What is happening is their own experience, insight. Masters are merely instruments to create an experience, which is actually an experience in the mind, in the, in the consciousness of the disciple. But we think master is doing it. The master that doing it is inside and that master with higher meditation we discover is our own self. So therefore the whole game is being played by the self inside. But it looks like the master doing from outside. And he used to give an example in his discourses. I had a chance to meet him several times. He was a neighbor in a town called Usharpur. My dad was teaching there and I was a student in that college. During the Second World War, Fakir Chand was posted on the battlefield in the baseline. And three of his disciples were in the front of the combat area. One day, they got ambushed. The three disciples got ambushed by the enemy. And they said, we are not going to be saved anymore. On all sides, we can't escape. Therefore, they said, let's pray to our master. We'll all be dying together that we should be uh, happy if he can take us wherever he wants to take us. The three sat in meditation and all three saw Baba Pakircha present. And he said, we are going to die. So, so what is your knowledge? He said, you will not die. Right behind where you are sitting right now, there is a bush. And under the bush, there is a tunnel. You remove the bush. On the tunnel, it will go behind the enemy lines. They stopped their meditation and went back. There was a bush. They removed the bush and there was a tunnel. They escaped from the tunnel and as soon as they got from the other side, they ran to their master. They said, Master, please, thank, we thank you, thank you, you saved our lives. He said, what are you talking about? I know nothing about it. But Master, you appeared. We saw you. He says, you saw me, I don't know anything about it. I am myself afraid some mob might hit on me. <laughs> so, Pakechan himself used to give example of this thing. And he said that uh, in one of, one of his discourses he was saying, there is a lady, a disciple of his, who had a pain in the stomach at night and she prayed to the master. And master appeared. Pakechan appeared in front of her and said, don't worry, you just take some black salt little lime on top of the shelf and dissolve it and take it, you'll be okay. So she took the black salt, got okay. In the morning she went to thank the master. He says, Babaji, thank you very much. You saved my life last night. He says, Bibi, don't talk like that. I don't go to women's homes like that. <laughs> <laughs> but what he explained there is a biography of Baba Kisa called the unknowing saint. He initiated people. Somebody asked him, if you know nothing, why are you initiating people? Why are you promising them that you can help them to go to their true home? He said, my master told me to do it. I'm carrying out his duty. I'm carrying out my duty. He told me, do it. I will do it. I said, did your master know everything? Oh, he knew everything. <laughs> but I know nothing. The... Uh, Explanation he gave sometimes was very interesting. 
He said when people talk of the master's power, they are looking at the master's body outside. They think the whole power is coming from that human being, that body. They don't realize the power is coming from an awareness in that human body, which has reached totality, where the soul, where the disciple's soul and the master's soul is the same. So when they say it's the master producing all this, is they're talking of the highest realm where there is only one totality. He used to explain this, but that never come in his books that I've read. But he did explain that when he talks about this, he's talking that it's a higher level at which the master and the disciple are one. When he says disciples are doing it themselves, he's talking of that level of the master. It's master's awareness, not the physical form, not the physical body of the master, but his awareness is connected with the disciple and with everybody else. So it's very remarkable how the man was talking all the time. I know nothing. I went to great master. I said, Baba saw nothing. Do you anything? He said, I know nothing. My master also told him, I know nothing. It's all the, all the disciples have their experiences and they know what is happening. Do you go and, uh, and appear in there when they die? I don't know anything when they die. They have, they, the master from inside appears. He records these things, some of his writings. So, it's not easy to understand, but I remember one beautiful ceremony, I think called Vesakhi or something, and people from far off had come. One of his disciples had himself become a saint, and his name was Sant Tarachan. And Sant Tarachan lived about a few hundred miles away from Usharpur. So, in that big festival, the saint also came, his disciple. And the saint, he naturally asked the saint to say text to him on the stage. So there is Baba Fakirchan and the Santarachan sitting next to him and he gives a discourse. In the discourse, as usual, he says, I know nothing, Pastor know nothing. And then he says, I'm very happy. At the end he said, I'm very happy. Our beloved uh, Santarachan is here. I will ask him to say a few words. Then Santarachan speaks. He said, don't believe this master. <laughs> if he knew nothing, I would not travel hundreds of miles to keep, come and put my head on his feet. Everything I've got is from him. And they both laughed. So it, it's very difficult to understand because masters act like absolutely ordinary human beings. They do not reveal their awareness. They function at different levels at the same time. Unlike us who go one step and we are very proud of it. Oh, I saw the earth itself. I had out of body experience. We got so impressed by that. Masters are operating at a level where they can be in awareness at all levels at the same time. Not only they can be, they are. When you meet a perfect living master, like great master Baba Saul saying, when he was as a human being sitting with us, he was also sitting at the top, also sitting at the intermediate stages. His awareness was at all places. The reason for that is when we now completely turned inside out, we are outside now. We have no connection with our inside self. When we withdraw our attention inside, it seems to go by stage by stage. We withdraw, become unaware of the outer body, then we get aware of the inner body. You can't be aware of both. Just like when you're sleeping and having a real dream, you can't be aware of your very body sleeping. There's a cutoff point. Each level of experience at different conscious levels is separate, individual. So when we want to withdraw to the astral plane, we have to forget and become unaware of the physical plane. When we want to withdraw to the causal plane, we have to become unaware of both physical and astral planes. When we go higher up to the soul level, we have to forget all these are body, not real. Soul is real. At each step, we only are aware of one form, one reality. These are realities created. They are created by the process of projection from consciousness, but for us, they are realities. And these reality levels 
only one reality we experience at one time. That is why when we are in physical reality, this is the only reality for us. All others we can find out, but we think this is real. We are finding from the reality here. But when you reach the top, which is totality of consciousness, everything, all these, all these levels are also there. Otherwise not total. If this were outside of that, that would not be totality. Totality means that everything is there. Therefore, one who has reached that level of awareness is constantly aware of all levels. That's perfect living masters. Perfect living masters are constantly aware of all levels. Therefore, when they speak to us as ordinary human beings, they're dealing with us as a human being at human level and talking like a human mind. But the awareness, when they speak of other levels, they speak not from remembering something, but what they're experiencing right then. So that is why there's a very big difference between masters at different levels, even up to the soul level, and the masters, perfect living masters who come from the top. And that is why perfect living masters, they live in very ordinary way. Why ordinary? If they are really masters, why don't they show off some of their mastery? <laughs> well, some people do. They wear very beautiful robes, orange colored robes, saffron colored robes, white robes. Some people do. Why don't perfect living masters also do this? Because they have not come to teach anything. These other masters have come to teach something. They teach us how to meditate. They teach us how to find something better than us. They teach us there is something more than this physical world. They teach us. Perfect living masters are not coming as teachers. They are coming simply to pick up the marked souls and take them back home. Their mission is different. Their mission is, therefore, when we think that we have been seeking for a long time and ultimately, when a perfect living master comes, his love pulls us. And we feel this is it. It's the end of our journey. Mind says the beginning of the journey. Now we meditate. Now we do this. That's why when somebody said, is it necessary to meditate? If you know the reality of the whole picture, the big picture, how marked souls are taken by masters back home and this is where the perfect living masters come in. They take their marked souls back home. So, it is not at all necessary to consider that these are enemies or these are friends. They are all part of the show. If you are meditating regularly, your compassion and love will grow automatically. I've seen that. Because you realize where are we, where are all of us coming from? Where the whole picture is being drawn from? One single source. We are part of that source. When we discover more, we are the source. They know the source. We are the source of all drama. But we have moved so far away to separations for the sake of experience. It's wonderful to have a vastness of experience. We have done a great job. Vastness of this universe. More vastness of the astral plane. Still more vastness of causal plane. We created time and space in a way nobody would have dreamt of it. And yet we did it successfully. And created so many beings. So many beings like ourselves. It's amazing. Now having done that great thing and made it real by cutting off the knowledge of all other forms except the one we are in at any given time. So it's such a beautiful show that we are here and we find that we are all coming from the one. Can you have an enemy after that? Who is your enemy if you are all one? In, in the Guru Granth Sahib it said Dujja Kisnu Vakiye there is no second. They are part of one. If you are part of one, whose enemy are we? Whose friends are we? It's a show of the one totality of consciousness. There are no enemies. If you think somebody is an enemy, say you are settling an old account, say thank you very much. One more question. When will the change of access to spirituality finalize? What should we expect to see as this change finalizes? Should we expect turmoil or other changes? When will the change of axis of spirituality finalize? 
what should we expect to see as this change finalizes? Should we expect turmoil or the change? Change is a wonderful thing. Change is a constant thing. It's not that there's a change that's taken place, now it ends. Still further change. In fact, nothing is as unchanging as change. People say if you want to understand change, look at a river, the flow of the water in the river. At every moment you are looking at a different water, the water is flowing. Yet the river is the same, the river never changes and the water changes. Life is like that. Changes take place all the time, but the spirit, the observer never changes, the experiencer never changes. The experiencer is the reality, not the experience which is always changing. When great masters predict there will be great changes, the changes will take place in the sense of there will be more seekers here, there will be more masters of various levels, giving instructions, teaching methods, more interest in meditation will take place, more interest in spiritual disciplines will take place, and it will be a much larger population that has been so far interested in this, it will be much larger population that will get interested in spirituality. But as it grows, more masters will appear here. And as the population grows of seekers, more perfectly masters will appear. Don't forget, masters appear where seekers are there. We don't we don't have some master sitting somewhere and we go and find them. Where seekers are, masters appear there. People talk of lineages. Great master clarified there is no lineage in a spiritual tradition. Masters appear where they are seekers. And they will appear more in this country, United States. They will appear in the West, which is a rare occurrence because many teachers have appeared preparing them. Even as early as 1937, great master said, many teachers are already there trying to draw the attention of people to something more than the physical, which is true. But as this seeking increases, more and more higher level of masters will appear. Eventually, perfectly masters master will be here. And many of them. So, there are some yuga, they say that the different epoch, epochs move and uh, we are in the Iron Age. In these ages, the problems that we are created for ourselves through attachment increases. The temptations increase. The, the things that attach, attempt us increase. Therefore, it becomes more and more difficult to do meditation. In Satya Yuga, it was easy. Then it became more difficult. More. Kali Yuga is the most difficult. When it is the most difficult, the largest number of masters appear. Because the seeking is strong, temptation is equally strong. So that is why this is a kind of prophecy he made, more masters will appear. And I have sat here, I am seeing the growth of spirituality and masters here. I have seen people who we never heard of. I was surprised by an experience that I had. There was a comedian in Hollywood named John Roger and he had some insight about spirituality and he saw a white bearded master inside in his dreams and he began to try to understand what he says and the master was teaching what great master is teaching. Later on he discovered that was the great master the image coming to him. Most likely from a past life connection. So he began to share that based on the instructions he was receiving in his own meditations. And he set up an institution called MSIA, Movement for Spiritual Inner Awareness, MSIA, in Hollywood. Most of his disciples were film producers, actors, actresses, 
and he was doing work which he thought some master is giving from inside. When he began to investigate who could it be, he found out that is Baba Saul Singh, great master of India. He saw his pictures. So he got two photographs of great master put in his bedroom. He had no other photograph except these two pictures of great master. I had no idea who John Roger is. I had no idea who other masters in this country are, what they are teaching. But in October of 2014, he died, died passed away. And he named one Mr. Morton to carry on his work, which he had named much earlier, so Mr. Morton took over and decided. One year later, in October 2015, a lady named Jan Shepherd, who worked with him for 40 years, was typing out a text of a memorial speech to be made on his annual passing away day. When she was doing that, by accident, somebody else's photo comes up on his corner computer. And she says, whose photo is that? But his photo would come. And then she sees my name written under the photo. He so put it, then she finds Disciple of great pastor Baba Sawal Singh. She said, John Roger has sent us this. She immediately gave credit to her master. Said that he has sent somebody who is a follower of the same master he was following. They tried to contact me. They contacted Jonathan. They contacted They said, we want to come to Chicago and make a, uh, make a, a video of an interview. I had a plan to go to California anyway in a couple of months. I said, why should they come here? I'm going there. I'll give them time there. I gave them time and one of the actresses interviewed me and I gave them the stories of Great Master. So many of John Rogers' followers now coming and telling me that what he was teaching was very similar. I had no idea. So what I am mentioning is that there are so many people teaching things like this. There was another person who with a younger assistant is also teaching in a ministry of light and sound. One day, and Jonathan remembers, one day he had deep meditation. He has been meditating from a childhood. Now maybe in his 50s, maybe 60s. Elderly man. Deep meditation, he says, he saw a man face coming very close to him, almost as close as near his eyes, and he saw the eyes of that person. And that person says to him, I know who you are. And then disappears. And he wonders what happened. He's never seen that face before, did not do anything. And he almost forgot about it. Two days later, somebody says, have you heard of Ishwar Puri? No, I have not heard of him at all. But he, he teaches also light and sound things. Is there something similar? He said, I have no idea. So he said, can you show me? And then they showed on the YouTube that this is the guy who came. So he contacts Jonathan. I want to come and check. What, what did he mean by saying, I know him? I don't know him at all. <laughs> Supposing he comes tomorrow to ask me, why do you say this? What should I tell? I don't know anything about you. Or should I say, yes, I know. I can tell you now. Make a big drama. I am pointing out these little events. I can multiply them. What's happening in this country, in the United States of America, so many are sprouting up here and there, bringing people to the importance of enlightenment in the real way, of finding out the truth. That's completely fulfilling the prophecy of the great master. Change of access is taking place and will continue to take place. I am here to watch, you are here to watch this. And let us enjoy the show of this great change. Thank you very much. I'll see you next month.